and voila. Brendan Quirk, uh, thank you very much for making the time. Um, this is, we've exchanged some messages over the past, oh, not quite year. Um, we've we've swum in sing similar circles, but it's really awesome to have you on the podcast. So thanks yeah. for making the time. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Ted. So let me ask you a question. Let me start by asking you a question. Yeah, go for it. How's your elbow? Like when you're on the bike for like eight hours, <laughs> is it bark at you? Like what's, what's different now? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I've broken my fair share of bones, primarily collarbones. And that's what I just described. Collarbones is really easy. You know, it is a, um, it's your body's crumple zone and that's designed to break. And when you repair it by putting a plate on it, it's very simple. Whereas your elbow is such a complex joint that we are now, what, probably seven or eight months post crash, post surgery. It, it drives me crazy. Uh, um, sleeping is really painful and it certainly affects my sleep. Um, I'm very thankful that I'm able to ride a bike and that it wasn't a complication to a lower extremity. But man, oh man, yeah, it is awful. And I, I never would have anticipated it being so bad. Even back when I broke it, I didn't think I'd actually broken it. It wasn't until I had an x-ray. And even then, you know, as a non-radiologist, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, it doesn't look that bad, having seen a lot of displaced <laughs> bones in the past. Yeah, yeah, sure. But then having heard from physicians who are like, yeah, that's the worst elbow break I've ever seen. Or Oof. the piecing together of bone dust was one particular bad omen. Um, no, in the scheme of things, I am glad that I'm mobile and able to ride a bike, but yeah, it does start barking. I rode for an hour this morning and it was bugging me. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a major bummer. Now I can guess after a long, long day or, you know, whatever, seven, eight hours, it's just, it's every little mm -hmm. ache and pain and barking thing really matters so mm -hmm. what is the longest race you've done this year uh 150 miles uh gravel locos in texas okay and it, it's not like it's accumulated fatigue pain it doesn't hurt worse after eight hours like i said i mean i rode for an hour okay. today and it was bugging me uh i mean i can temper the pain with ibuprofen uh you know nsaid type of type of yeah medicine um yeah, it, it feels like um, it just, it aches. It feels like an arthritic pain where it just sort of emanates. And there's, whew, yeah, I remember being told back in my hockey days that I was going to grow up and have arthritis all over the place. And at that point, when you're 18 years old, you feel invincible. And then yeah, you oh get yeah. a decade or two later and you're like, oh, <laughs> I get it. Boy, well, I hope over time, maybe that uh, it mellows out a little bit. But yeah, I know that was a tough one. Uh, yeah. I was, I was bummed that it happened in my home state, too. Right, so right, So I want right. good memories there. No, I, I appreciate all the help in that race and, and, you know, getting me set up in Arkansas for the Big Sugar. And I still had a very good time and I have fond memories of Arkansas. And most certainly we're going to talk about those sort of things today. Um, I was talking about riding my bike for an hour today. Um, let's start with with an easy softball. How often do you get out on the bike these days? It, when I'm in town, so um, I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. I split time between my hometown of Little Rock and Colorado Springs where USA Cycling is. And I keep a bike in each place. Um, so, you know, when as time allows, um, you know, I'm out there, I'm out there four days a week you know, try to ride. If I can get Friday, my goal typically is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. If I can get it a hundred K I'm a happy guy during the week. It's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I can get out one day during the week, I make it happen. Um, but Friday, Saturday, Sunday is when I get after it. You know, I, um, last, uh, sanctioned race I did, I, I went hard after it cyclocross the winter before COVID and, uh, you know, I went hard after it in my terms, raced seven or eight times mm -hmm. regionally, and then last year, the big event that I kind of targeted that kept me motivated was the rule of three, the inaugural rule of three. Nice. Um, it, and it was a blast. It, um, it rained. It didn't rain as much as I think it rained this year. From what I heard, I didn't get to do it this year. 
Um, but I think so long as you have an event hanging out there, you know, I, I definitely get motivated by those, you know, a, I wouldn't call them race, a race events though. And uh, I still love it. You know, I've been riding bikes since the mid eighties and it's still uh, my favorite thing to do. It's still my therapy. Uh, and I still absolutely love bike racing and nerd out, you know, watching the Giro, you know, on this pirated, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but on a pirated <laughs> European feed through a VPN. Yeah. And um, I still think the sport is the most amazing thing in the history of mankind. And um, I love connecting with it in any way I can. Nice. Uh, I, I asked my first two questions out of order, and you, you certainly hit on a lot of those things here. This this was meant to be my first question, and it's intentionally vague. Where or how does cycling fit into your life? Yeah, it's absolute center of it. Everything, my, my, my sense of self is constructed around the journey I've been on as a cyclist, as someone who spent a lengthy period of time in cycling retail um, you know, my greatest memories, most of the friends I've been lucky enough to meet in my life, like a lot of folks, I'm sure, you know, they've all been through the bike. Mm -hmm. Most of my greatest memories are around the bike. Um, I just, I, um, you know, the house I live in, the car I drive, I attribute it to the bike industry. Um, it's, you know, outside of, you know, my wife and my three kids, pretty much I have, you know, nothing outside of cycling. Um, so I'm grateful for it. I love it. I appreciate it. Uh, sometimes I hate it, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, yeah, I just think it's, uh, I'm so grateful that it got into my life, uh, when I was a teenager a long time ago when it was a whole lot less popular than it is now. I just, I, I count my lucky stars every day. Nice. Yeah. I feel many all similar vibes towards the bike it is i mean i often answer that question as you know it's it's the central tenet to my life it is all day every day seemingly revolves around the the bike um i think i'd read that you got your first at that point uscf license in the in the mid 80s uh what, you were a teenager then? You just sort of fell into the sport how that start off yeah i mean it's the classic i'm kind of the classic um you know, child of the Greg LeMond era. You know, I was a boneheaded, you know, 15 year old in L Little Rock, Arkansas, where I am right now. Um, typical stuff, playing soccer, playing football. Yeah, I did, I actually competitively, I did a lot of swimming. And um, one day, one weekend, I was flipping through the channels and oh my God, um, it's the 1986 Tour de France. You know, Greg LeMond and Bernardi know we're literally trying to murder each other in the Alps. Uh, you, know, you got John Tesh and John Tesh music, you know, narrating it all. And my eyes got about this big. You know, I'd, I'd literally never seen a mountain before. I'd never seen, you know, the snow-capped Galibier and all of that. Um, I'd never seen anything like that. And um, I just something clicked. It's like, oh, this is my, my life is meant to be in a pursuit of this. I went out and bought my first bike, did my first bike race and a pair of Sperry topsiders. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and, um, never looked back, you know, a couple few years later, I went to college, um, you know, races junior did junior nationals, uh, Reading PA in 1988, uh, went from there, raced collegiately. And, um, you know, those were interesting times in collegiate racing where you had guys like Jonas Carney, Marty Nothstein, who ended up being a gold medalist in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. you know, they were all for goofs racing collegiately on the side um, in the East Coast. And so it was this great experience on the one hand, you know, continuing this kind of early journey into bike racing, but at the same time getting some exposure to what at that point was an incredible East Coast criterium scene. At that point, you know, the U.S. Pro Championships in Philadelphia was like one of the great one-day races in the world. Yeah, for sure. uh, you had the Tour de Trump, Tour de Pont going on. So I just got sucked into it, and my mania for the sport just accelerated like crazy. And um, I, I knew this is being around this for the rest of my life is what I was destined to do. So I, grew, I got into cycling – uh, similar path. I never raced juniors. I got into it th through collegiate cycling. Um, love that scene. It was it was early two thousand, so certainly in the wake of Lance. So love him or hate him. I mean, he's he's he put cycling. He made cycling blow up in North America. Having not experienced that that previous generation fifteen years prior, 
did Le Mans just blow up cycling in North America? Yo, for sure he did. I mean, he, he made it right. He was sports illustrated sportsman of the year, which like back okay. in the day was a big, big deal. He made cycling mainstream. And I think when you look at, you know, you look at the arc of cycling in America over the last, let's call it 35 years, you know, since Greg LeMond first won the tour, the, the biggest impact he made a phrase that I used to use in my you know, b- bike retail days was it's the normalization of cycling. You know, you no longer look at cycling as being a niche Olympic sport like fencing or the modern pentathlon, <laughs> but it's something that you can actually talk about. You can go into, a, you know, a, a party and, and talk about how you ride bikes and race bikes and people don't look at you like you're a, a freak. Mm-hmm. And that's, I was like, that's the biggest impact that Lamont had, you know, doing Taco Bell commercials and things like that. He brought it into the mainstream. Lance made it popular from a participatory standpoint, okay. but Lamond made it so that it was acceptable yeah. in normal social circles to be involved. And I think that was the biggest gift that he gave to uh, people who love bike racing in America and the American bike industry at the time. Yep. Interesting. Um, what was the state of, of bike shops? Um, I mean, er, as back as early the 19, call it 86, like, was it easy to go into a bike shop and buy your first bike? Uh, did you have to go across the state to find a bike shop? Like, what was that? No, we had a great bike shop here in Little Rock called chain wheel. Um, that, yeah, I went in and bought a, you know, I think I spent 350 bucks on a steel Trek Mm -hmm. uh, bike and, you know, went on the journey, you know, bought a pair of, you know, tubular wheels, you know, six months later, because I was told that was the best upgrade you could get, got pissed my parents off by getting tubular glue all over the front porch of our house, trying to (laughs) learn how to to glue on sew-ups. And, um, but no, I mean, I think what you had, there was, there's probably a heyday of bike shops, um, you know, 80s and 90s, where you had these um, hardcore race bike shops where, you know, they had all of the bad to the bone race frames on the wall, Colnagos and Tomasinis and Pinarellos. Um, you know, you really got into customizing the wheels that you were building. You know, occasionally you would, um, you know, see some really exotic power meter or something like that come through. And um, there was a real sense of scarcity and magic and a real focus on racing in the road that if you loved racing in the road, was in, it was intoxicating. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what you have now is a much more homogenous retail experience where people are far better at retail mm-hmm. um, because they're business people instead of being driven by passion for the sport. You know, it's an awful lot of the of the same brands and awful lot of the same visual merchandising and a lot of the what makes it freaky deaky um is gone um it's you know probably better for the industry but if you're you know way out there deeply in love with european road racing it's it it was really cool back then in a way that maybe it's not as cool as cool now Mm -hmm. i'd argue yeah interesting um so co-founder owner of competitive cyclists um, was that, was the development of that company, was that your first real job or had that? Yeah. Talk to me yeah. about competitive cyclist. Yeah, it was. I, um, you know, I, um, yes, it was my first real job and it, it started as a tiny little bike shop and it's just a shoe box. Mm-hmm. And, um, we basically tried to build exactly what I described, which was this freaky deaky, um, you know, high end oriented shop. The challenge is we started it in the mid nineties when, um, you know, the Lance effect, if you will, had not happened yet. Little Rock's a uh, small city, you know, mm-hmm. about a quarter of a million people. So your market for high-end bikes is basically non-existent. So we kind of tried to bridge the gap. There was a good race scene here, and so, you know, small, but good, good enough where we could kind of traffic in enough, you know, cool frames, cool wheels. And it was really, you could scratch the itch of that passion. But we developed sort of a normal retail, you know, bike shop thing um, what, what happened though, is you saw the emergence of these, you know, listserv groups and use net forums and things like this. And, um, we started spending time on there, um, because we wanted to find more people who shared this passion for racing. And so we started to sell, you know, like used campy nouveau record and super record parts and stuff like that. But like on, you know, what was sort of like a prehistoric form of Reddit is what it looked like with no pictures, no video. Um, and we, I still have a little notebook with people's credit card numbers written down in it from the late 90s. And then, um, you know, we the, the, the Internet then turned into something where you could actually 
kind of prehistoric version of being able to do credit card processing, sort of prehistoric e-commerce. And it was like, Eureka, this, this, you know, this is a way for us. To, it was less about making money. It was more an excuse to bring in a little bit more inventory that was cool and connect with people nationwide mm. who had this love of, of high-end cycling stuff. And that's when we started Competitive Cyclist. Um, you know, the first big risk that we took was I literally got a, um, a bank loan against my house to, and my house was small and not worth much, uh, um, to buy 10 SRM power meters oh, wow. directly from Germany because you couldn't, I, I think there was one shop called Schwab Cycles in, in Idaho um, that sold SRM, except for them, nobody sold them. And power, people were starting to talk a little bit about power. Right. So I thank God I got somebody in Germany who could speak English and um, we ordered uh, 10 power meters and you put those 10 power meters on a shelf kind of on our back room and are still, it was still a shoebox of a bike shop and like sales reps from, in fact, I remember our Cannondale sales rep because we were selling Cannondale at the time he came in and he saw those 10 SRMs and his jaw just hit the floor. Yeah. Right. It's like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. We sold those 10 really quickly and, um, we were like, okay, we're, we're onto something here. And uh, over time, we closed down the retail bike shop. We focused explicitly on the internet. And then, you know, one thing led to another over the next 10 years and two knuckleheaded bike racers in Little Rock, Arkansas, you know, we built what was the biggest e-commerce business in North America for cycling. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it was 100% founded on passion for the bike and passion for bike racing. We were not selling stuff. We were connecting to our customers through our shared love of cycling. And that's what, that's what made it all work. And that's what made it so cool. And that's why we knew we were invincible. The, the only reason we weren't invincible is because, um, you know, nowadays people always talk about raising capital and all this money I'm raising. What my valuation? We raised no money. We, um, we were shucking and jiving to be able to, um, uh, you know, cash flow this business. We were leaning on our vendors very hard for business terms. We had a great relationship with our bank. And finally, we were growing so rapidly. Um, we got to the point where we realized, hey, um, this, this is not a sustainable way to grow our business. And we're actually kind of strangling the growth of the business by not actually finding funding. Hmm. So as we began to think about starting that process, one thing led to another. And um, uh, an organization called Liberty Media which owned at that point a company called backcountry.com approached us backcountry had been pouring a lot of money into trying to figure out how to grow their cycling business. Mm -hmm. You might've raced against a team called the real cyclist team back yeah, in the day, back sure. in, you know, that was their, that was their road bike property. Uh, but they were just failing at cycling. And so one thing led to another, it's a classic story. They made us an offer. We couldn't refuse. Uh, we sold the company lock, stock and barrel to them. And the thing I'm proudest about is Liberty media now owns formula one. They owned us for a while. Oh my, so. <laughs> that's wild. Uh, yeah. When, when you were, when you were saying that as you are trying to grow, uh, uh, you run into the issue of basically strangling the company. Is it like you, you're just turning over every dollar. I mean, did you need to build a bigger inventory or what is it as simple as that? It's well, I mean, that's exactly right. That's one component of it is you want to build more inventory. You want to bring up more brands as sales grow. You want to get a greater depth of inventory for us being an e-commerce company. Um, your technology overhead is very high. This is right. This is before Shopify or big commerce. Mm -hmm. So we had to build, we had to build our own carton checkout. We had to build our whole front end experience. We had to build our whole own content management system and so on and so forth. All of our tools to do merchandise planning, all of the stuff back then was built from scratch. I mean, the difference in technology nowadays is so monumental. Mm -hmm. um, the barriers to entry for e-commerce now are so low because of Shopify and WordPress and things like this. None of that existed. And so, um, you know, if you made a few bad hires on the technology side or a few had a few bad um, relationships with service providers and technology, it could just crush your business. And we just had an incredible streak of luck where the organizations that we partnered with and the people we hired were incredible. And um, yeah, so we, uh, we worked really, really hard. And that was you know, one part of the success story. But the other part is you got to have luck. And yeah. we really had so much luck in terms of the relationships that we had. Do you, are you naturally 
entrepreneurial or or foresightful? I mean, this is such an interesting era. It's sort of the the birth of e-commerce. Uh, presumably, this is a pre-Amazon era. Or, or was, yeah, is it a dose of dumb luck? Like, what are the success points? I, I think it's all, I think it's all of the above. I think um, what I was once told is the number one rule of business is that timing is everything. Sure. And I happen to have this incredible passion for a sport that was exploding in popularity at the dawn of e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And I chose, to, you know, a group of us chose to dive in and go for it. Um, so I think that, I don't, I don't think we knew that the timing of all that stuff was happening at once. We just were there and we took advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the difficult thing now is that it's tough to be entrepreneurial in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many brands, so many companies, every conceivable thing is being sold in 50 different ways. And you've got Amazon doing this, uh, you know, Amazon doing their thing over here. I mean, it's really hard now. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was all just blue sky. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody knew what this was gonna look like. And so I don't know if I was naturally entrepreneurial, um, it was just, I was, I was excited and driven and, uh, yeah, like I said, we just went for it. Sure. So that time segues, you know, looking at your CV, that time segues to then working with backcountry for a couple, couple of years and, and presumably that success. And then the geographic connections to Arkansas brought about you becoming the president of, of Rafa North America. Um, yeah, how did that happen? Yes. Yeah, so we were when we were competitive, we were the biggest retailer of Rafa, I think, in the world. I think in the US, we were selling more Rafa than Rafa was at wow. that time. Their direct to consumer business was, I think, was still just getting off the ground. And so we I established a great relationship with Rafa. You know, the first time that Rafa clothing was shown in the US, it was in New York City. And it was literally like in a an office in um, in Manhattan, hmm. and it was uh, you know I, we brought in some of our good customers from New York City from competitive Simon Matram came over from London, um, and it was like a cocktail party, it was like a trunk <laughs> show. I mean, it's amazing to think what the company is now and what that that night was like back in I yeah. forget what year it was, two thousand six or something like that. But Simon and I hit it off because we were both on a very similar Simon Matram, the founder and sure. CEO of Rafa. Uh, we hit it off um, immediately, and um, we did a big, big business with Rafa. I think I, I, I um, uh, like to think that we were a, a, a meaningful part of their early uh, era growth in the United States. And uh, Simon and I just stayed very close. Hmm. And so once I left backcountry, you know, I was not a, a huge fan of working for a big corporate company with a CEO, frankly, who I, I did not like and did not respect, um, never had had a boss before. It was not a good, not a good first, first sample of what it's like to have a boss. Interesting. And um, so when we sold the company, part of it, I had a contract um, to uh, work at Backcountry for four years. It was a long time, long prison sentence is how it started feeling like. So we had, we moved the company to Park City. So um, it was probably my greatest business regret of all time. Really the magic of competitive is what we were building in Arkansas. Yeah. But one of the points of the deal is we had to move everything out to, to Utah. And everybody's like, oh, you get to move to Park City. I, it's 40 years old, never skied my whole life, not very fond of snow. And uh, by God, I tried to learn how to ski. It yeah. was not very, it was not pretty, but um, we, um, yeah, the contract was four years after about two and a half years. I'm like, I can't take this anymore. Mm -hmm. This is insane. You guys are, I think they really sucked the soul out of competitive. A uh, lot of uh, disagreements about strategic direction for competitive and backcountry as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I chose to leave and it, it, I mean, I'll be very frank. It cost me a, boatload of money, but it was soul crushing, uh, having to be there every day was just agony and, um, just wasn't worth a year and a half of my life. Um, and so I left and I had a non-compete and so I goofed off for a year, rode my bike a lot. Um, I think I saw you race up guards from the pass and, and right. tour of Utah once. Sure. I think you might've asked to be pushed at the top of it. Perhaps that, That's a steep climb. I believe it. <laughs> I've raced this year. I want a, I want a good push. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. So anyways, then I went to go work for Rafa. They, huh. uh, Simon asked if I would join, help grow. Um, they thought the business in the U S had some, some upside. 
and um, worked there for about three years. And it was an incredible experience. I got to spend a lot of time in London, a lot of time in Europe. And that was a real gift. And uh, yeah, it was, that was a blast. Um, you might have just answered it. What are, your, what are your thoughts on competitive now? And is it heartbreaking to see what it, what it is now? Or, or, or has it come out of this little? Uh, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's nothing like what it was. I mean, yeah. we were content driven, yeah. very soulful. It's all about passion of the sport. The, 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 the strategy that we had, you know, you look at 2010, 2011, what e-commerce was turning into every business was a content was not a, everybody cares about content now, but back then nobody cared about content. Sure. It was all about building vending machines, right? These just vending machines on computers is what e-commerce was. Mm -hmm. I, that's what competitive is now. It's just a vending machine on a computer. It's, it, um, you know, it fell Back, it fell off the back, you know, 2014, 2015. Um, and it's unfortunately, I think that's probably still the case now. I think that the saving grace is that they've got uh, uh, long standing relationships with great brands and are highly efficient at what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're huge. I mean, it's, you know, I look at the revenue size where they are now, and that's, that was like ultimate dream. You know, what the business has accomplished economically, it's accomplished the greatest you know, the greatest outcomes I could ever imagine. And it is business. And that is the point, but the business was founded on passion. What got me excited to go to work every day there was passion. And, um, I don't, the passion doesn't, it just doesn't come through. And I think that's the, that's the opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's also what's, you know, disappointing. And, um, somebody will figure that out. Somebody will find a way to build a passion driven, genuine content driven cycling e-commerce company. And that's the company that will take down competitive over time. So if you're out there listening and you want to do it, get my info from Ted, because I would love to be on your board of advisors because mm -hmm. I think there's so much opportunity there. Yeah, we certainly live in an interesting time. Uh, vending machine is a perfect term for click it one button it's at your house the next day or shorter than that in some some instances it's crazy yeah right um so another arkansas connection is is becoming the the cycling program director at the runway group which is the group set up by cycling nuts and quite frankly some of the wealthiest people on planet earth uh stuart and tom walton what what does that position look like what does it mean to be a cycling program director yeah so there they are um they're very, very motivated to transform Northwest Arkansas into one of the most amazing places to live in America. And they have a multifaceted strategy for doing that. But one, you know, one of the foundational pieces of that is to make, uh, make it a, a, a through and through uh, cycling, uh, just a, 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 an amazing place to be if you're a cyclist, make it amazing to live there, amazing if you're and out of town or you want to come in and spend a weekend or a week there. Um, and, you know, what they had done, you know, going all the way back to 2007, 2008 was build mountain bike trails. And that's a, that's a great way to start, but they realized there was a lot more that they needed to, a lot, a, a lot, a whole lot more pieces that you need to put around it to really make the experience that they um, wanted to maximize quality of life, maximize the economic impact of cycling for Northwest Arkansas. So, you know, they bought Rafa when I was there. Um, that's where I first met them. What's crazy is I'm from Arkansas. I'm crazy about bikes. They're from Arkansas. They're crazy about bikes. We'd actually never met because they're up in Bentonville, which is way up in the northwest corner of the state. I live about three hours away in Little Rock, right in the middle of the state. And so we, we'd never cross paths. And, and I was mostly riding road bikes. You know, they're, they're nuts for mountain bikes. And, um, um, you know, started talking to him. I, I, I decided I was going to leave Rafa. Uh, at the time, you know, I, I flew to, uh, I flew to London from Little Rock 24 times, I think in 30 months, wow. uh, as part of my job. And I, I lived on an airplane during the three, two and a half, three years I worked at Rob. I just couldn't take it anymore. It was just too much travel. Mm -hmm. I got three kids. It was just, it was too much. And so when let them know I wanted to leave, Walton's got in touch and said, Hey, look, are you staying in Arkansas? You know, here's what we're trying to do with cycling, making it amazing in Northwest Arkansas. Can you help us figure out the strategy and make it come to life? So, you know, what the role was, I basically triangulated 
the work that they were doing to um, invest in for-profit companies uh, that were oriented to cycling that could have a material impact in Northwest Arkansas. It's to um, help them with their philanthropy strategy. Uh, the Walton Family Foundation is one of the most impressive institutions you will ever uh, see in your entire life. I think the last number I saw, I think it was 2020 maybe, the Walton Family Foundation did uh, charitable gifts of $600 million. Um, it's just, you know, staggering their generosity. But what's also staggering is how well structured and thoughtful their strategy is for deploying that money. It's not willy nilly. Um, it is extremely methodical. And thank God, you know, cycling is part of that strategy. Um, and so how they deploy those resources, they have a whole team of people, but they wanted some added cycling expertise. And so I was a voice in that. Mm -hmm. And then it's also public policy, how public policy comes to life in Arkansas to make sure that on a local level and on a state level, um, we're really, really friendly. And that could be about, you know, how do we think about active transportation infrastructure? What's the future of transportation look like? How do we think about, um, you know, e-bike? How do we, how do we make uh, e-bike legislation very favorable in Arkansas? Hmm. Um, so we, you know, we, we, I was triangulating those three things. It's for-profit investment, philanthropy, and public policy to really make Northwest Arkansas and Arkansas as a whole fantastic for cycling. And it was a blast. I really enjoyed my time doing that. Yeah, I bet. Well, it's, it is nothing but impressive. I talked, you know, virtually anybody in the cycling world, it's almost, um, at, at this point, it just seems sort of an inevitability that they're going to make their, their way to Northwest Arkansas, whether to a, a massive bike race or the, the phenomenal trails that are there. Um, it, I often describe it as feeling like I'm walking into the set of the Truman Show. Um, it just, it feels... <laughs> different um my one comical example was a pouring rainy day this must have been 2020 fall of there was an outer bike there and it was pouring rain and there was somebody who was like a, a local municipal agent uh a town worker who was pressure washing the road on a pouring rainy day and i was just thinking wow like this is not <laughs> this ain't normal um and you ride the trails there and it it's something special um so yeah if i think what you're going to see I, I, I think what you're going to see over time in bentonville mm -hmm. i think um the the walton family has been incredibly generous and you know with the i think this kind of the single source of funding for a lot of the initial development mm -hmm. um you know a lot of people use that that truman show example what what's happening now that i'm excited about is you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurship bubble up where you have independent yeah. people coming in and building bike businesses, um, whether it's you know services, whether it's hospitality, whether it's brands, you're starting to see these people come in, you're starting to see outsiders come in and it's you're, there's a lot more in the mix now. Mm -hmm. And so what I think you're gonna see in a two to three year timetable is um, a lot more of the, the really fun, you know, messiness and chaos that you get in um, you know other cool cities, you know, let's call it like a, a bend or or someplace like that, which mm -hmm. is an amazing outdoor destination with a lot of different points of view and a lot of different people doing different things. That's that's it's not just it's not just coming to Bentonville in the future. I mean, it's, it's there now. Mm -hmm. It's just you haven't seen it scale up yet. But that's my prediction of what's going to happen in three years. It's going to look different, and I think it's going to be um, it's going to be even cooler. Yeah, I believe it. I mean. It's certainly more than one hand. Uh, I'm at this point, you got to count on two hands or more the number of friends and cycling acquaintances who have moved there for either entrepreneurial stuff or, or you know, the cycling industry moving there. So, okay, switching gears. Naturally, I want to talk uh, about USA Cycling. I'm a, yeah. I'm a product of domestic road racing. Um, I'm a huge fan of domestic road racing. I want to see it succeed, and we're in a we're in a very interesting time. Um, you have served as the chair of the board, and now you are the, the CEO of USA Cycling, uh, I think since late 2021. Um, my Christmas, it was my Christmas present. Right on. <laughs> Good Christmas present. So let's, let's just pretend I know nothing about the way a board works. Um, first things first, what, what, does a, what does it mean to be the board of USA Cycling? 
to be on the board at USA Cycling, basically the board is comprised of, of, of um, at-large members. These are just people, could be any background, any, um, they could care about grassroots racing. They could not have anything to do with cycling altogether, but you've got four grassroots or uh, four at-large members. You've got three representatives of the USA Cycling Foundation because the foundation and the fundraising that they do is very critical for um, our, our athletics program, your Team USA. And then we have four athlete representatives on the board. So it's 11 people all together. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically what the purpose of the board is, is we're there to, you know, uh, you know, it's to care for the organization. It's to monitor the CEO. It's to approve budgets. It's to... Uh, uh, it's to advise on the strategy and approve the strategy, but it's just to give oversight to the organization as a whole. Um, and uh, the chairman then, which I served in that role briefly, is there to manage the board, basically just to make sure the board is productive and doing what it needs to be doing. But it's just kind of like, I would say high level care and feeding and um, you know of, of the organization as a whole is what the board is there to do. Mm-hmm. So in, in- it occurs to me that a sports governing body is is something of a thankless job. Um, I mean, their <laughs> governing bodies in general have a feeling of acrimony that is directed yeah. toward them. Um, so, for example, when I lob, I lob the question out to Twitter, hey, I'm going to be having this conversation with you. Um, what kind of questions come up? And, and there's a fair amount of negativity that comes gestured back in the direction of USA Cycling. Yeah, sure. Uh, first question, why do you suppose that is? Um, you know, I, I think, I think there's some really good reasons why. I mean, I think as I reflect over the last six, six years, I think there's been a lot of neglect of grassroots racing, um, in, in, across America. And, you know, when you look at the event organizers, you look at the clubs, you look at local associations, um, you know, it's, it's, they have been many respects neglected by USA Cycling. As you look at local associations, actually the funding that USA Cycling formerly gave to local associations like NEBRA in your neck of the woods, mm-hmm. um, they actually cut that funding. So organizations like NEBRA uh, really struggle to deliver uh, racing on a local level. You know, if, if In America, if we can't deliver bike racing on a local level, we're screwed. And we're not just screwed in terms of you know, folks like me who are not, you know, I have no hope of ever being a world tour rider for me, you know, cat three glory was the best I was ever going to know, but man, the Wednesday night criterium series really meant a lot to me. And it, you know, there's stuff that goes on in the background to make sure that those races come to life and USA cycling should be there to support it over the last six years. The organization just hasn't done it. Uh, and, 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 and if you can't deliver on grassroots racing, um, you know, we're also, we're, we're going to be pretty hosed in terms of, um, developing elite athletes mm-hmm. to, to win Olympic medals, to go to world championships, to do the things that are really, really, you know, the other, the elite side of the, of the equation, things that we really have to deliver on, uh, we're going to fail at that as well, because with no grassroots, the, um, you know, the pool of talent that you're pulling from for the elite side, your elite athletics program is just going to get smaller and smaller. So that's, you know, that's what we're trying to turn around right now is, um, you know, we have got to get our act together, reconnect with key folks in the grassroots side of the sport, find better ways to support them. And we're really, really focused on that. Mm -hmm. Is you look at something like the success of NICA. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, NICA and USA Cycling are not affiliated. Is that still accurate? We're, no, we're a sponsor of NICA. We're actually a cash sponsor of NICA. Okay. And uh, we've got a great relationship with NICA. Um, you know, the kids who race in NICA, their points actually count towards their USA Cycling points, which if you're a pretty serious mountain bike racer, that's really critical because grid position at the start of racing is so important in mountain sure. bikes. Yeah. Um, that's something that we have been told by NICA is intensely valuable. We offer free USA Cycling memberships to NICA members. Uh, we actually cut a check to NICA every year to support their operations. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've actually got a great relationship with them. And I think that as I look forward, the thing I'm most excited about in the relationship is that, you know, you raced in college, I raced in college. You know, the college racing scene right now is pretty sucky. Yeah. You know, if you don't go, you know, if you don't live in Colorado, you don't live in Utah, um, it's, you know, there's some, you know, Milligan and some schools like that 
Yeah, they're, they're, they're one-off schools that are just doing these miraculous things outside of Colorado and Utah, but it's, it's very intermountain West oriented. Uh, and so I am, uh, I am on full overdrive to begin to breathe real life into collegiate racing in the United States, both at the club level and the varsity level. I don't think it's a choice. I think mm-hmm. it's both. And um, I've had great conversations with the new president of NICA, with uh, Bob Burns, who's the chairman of NICA. And I said, look, this is one of the most important initiatives for USA Cycling is to invest in a big way in collegiate. And this is not a USA Cycling initiative. We want to do this hand in hand with the bike industry, with schools, with NICA, with everybody involved. And NICA is like, that is, you know, that is possibly the single most valuable thing you can be doing for NICA is to really grow collegiate cycling because they've got, what is it, 40,000 kids racing? And if you're not going to go to CMU or you're not going to go to Milligan, it's like, holy moly, I spent the last four years falling in love with mountain bike racing. Where do I go? Mm-hmm. There's, there's not a there there. So if we can build a really robust collegiate race scene, what happens is more kids are going to jump into NICA because they're going to see all the opportunity for them to continue in racing uh, once they graduate from high school. Mm-hmm. So that is something from USA Cycling you'll hear a little bit about in the second half of this year and a whole lot more about in 2023, but it's, um, I would call it one of our very most important initiatives. Sure. That's, that's outstanding. Yeah. Collegiate racing is, it's, it's funny cause it's just so pocketed. Um, I mean, I think it, it does well in new England, especially two decades ago when I was into it just geographically, yep. you have so many schools that are close together. You can go have a good time. My school, I probably, I think is a great example. Middlebury college, small school of 2,500 kids. I know right now, as a result of the the current cycling president, he's galvanized a club, and you know he gets the Wednesday night rides and the weekend rides going. So he's got twenty five kids at the at this program. That's awesome, which is outstanding. And I know for the previous twenty years, it's it's ebbed and flowed from like a, when I was running it, there were two kids who would ride a bike, and then you get it up to twelve. And yeah, to have any sort of. Uh, uh, regularity and consistency, I think, would be magnificent. You 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 mentioned the number of forty thousand kids in mountain biking in high school. What are the are there tangible examples of things to build road racing and criterium racing and and I guess call it traditional road bike cycling at that age? That's a great question. I mean, I think that. Um... We're facing a real issue with road cycling in the U.S. right now at at all levels. And, um, you know, the the races that inspired so many people, your tour of California's, your tour of Utah's, tour of Georgia's, you know, we've got we got nothing. And um, that is that is tough. And and it's tough on all levels, tough from junior level. It's also tough from a domestic um, elite level. You've got teams like Avolo or Hot Tubes. And they're like, holy moly, our budgets are really going to go up because we're going to be spending a whole heck of a lot more time in Europe to, to get the kind of racing that we need. So I think that that the way we are, um, the way we're wrapping our heads around it right now, because I think that the road situation is in a tough enough spot, we're kind of breaking it up into two kind of two buckets. Um, the bucket that we're focused on right now is criterium racing. It's a classic American form of road racing, much easier to put on. Um, and what, what we are, are actively doing is doing everything we can to be supportive of the, kind of the criterium scene in the U.S., the American Criterium Cup that's going on right now. Um, we, we, you know, we played an essential role. And you know, once USA Crits kind of detonated at the end of last year, we got in touch with all of those race organizers. It's 10 races, it's 13 different domestic teams, and we're the organization that brought them all together to say, look, this, this, this unified series can't go away. Mm-hmm. Can't go away. It's just like, it's gonna be road, road cycling US is a tough enough spot. You guys are heroes for finding funding for teams, for finding sponsors for races. Let's all work together, not just to save the series, but to actually make the series better. And I will tell you, you try to get together 10 different really good race promoters, 13 different team directors, and get them to agree on a plan. So Chuck Hodge, who works for us at USA Cycling, who's our chief of the vets, like I'm going to tell you, he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize for the work that he did to bring this together. And it's it's not only 
is the series happening? Uh -huh. But the series is elevated. The teams are getting, um, I think, better funding in terms of, of uh, minimizing their travel overhead. Teams care less about prize money and more about defraying travel costs because you, you ain't always going to finish in the money, but you're always going to have to pay for hotels and airfare. Mm -hmm. And so um, we worked that in their favor for the race organizers. Um, we worked out an amazing deal with outside to do excellent quality streaming of the races, which is what they really care about. And actually also the, yeah. the, the, the team promoters really care about that. The first race down in Anniston, uh, Alabama, was about, what, a month, six weeks ago. Um, outside the stoked. They're like, man, oh, man, oh, man. What we saw from uh, live, you know, people watching the race live uh, exceeded all of their expectations. So the demand is there. The desire is there to see Criterium Racing. Unfortunately, Rochester got rained out a couple – was it last weekend? Yeah. Um, but I'm really excited with what we're going to see with, you know, these really great races coming up, Tulsa Tough, Harlem – uh, you know, Indy, some of these other great races. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're going to, we're going to give people a product that they can at least watch on outside, get excited about, and hopefully scratch the itch to race. So that, that's the criterion part. Then in terms of road racing, I think this is, this is ultimately what our gravel strategy is. We're not really engaged in gravel right now at USA Cycling, but you know what? What is inevitable is people come from road, go start in road racing, go to gravel. You know, start in BMX, go to mountain bike, start in gravel. Well, you know, they need to come over to some of those folks need to come over to road racing. Mm -hmm. And what's critical for us as an organization is to build pathways from adjacent forms of cycling and bike racing to come into the sort of traditional forms of bike racing where we play a significant role. So it's, you know, how do we communicate with folks who discovered their love of the bike through gravel? Because so many people have. Um, they're going to see the Tour de France on TV and they're going to say, holy moly, that's amazing. I want to do a road race or I want to do a criterion. How do we as an organization build a pathway to make it easier for them to find a road racing club or a race or to learn how to race in a pack in a road race, which is definitely different from riding in a gravel event? How do we make it really easy for them to dip their toe for the first time in road racing and, um, and stick around and, and race, race a bunch? So that I think those – between criterium racing and works we're trying to work we're trying to do to build pathways from gravel into road, we've got a lot of work to do that I think will help uh, elevate road cycling in the U.S. Fantastic, I like that a lot. Um, yeah, I don't disagree for an instant. I feel like if every little town in America had a criterium race, much like many of them have had for the past twenty years, and they come and go. It would just do. It would be such a boom for the, the the industry and cycling and kids getting into it. And I mean, there's nothing more exciting like standing on the sidelines and and seeing this path yeah. go by. It's you, you always play think, Ted. I was on a. So I was. Um, I was actually there was a UCI mountain bike race up in Bentonville a month ago, and I was yeah. up there for that. And I brought my bike with me. I brought my road bike, mm -hmm. and they have a Tuesday night nitro road ride um, up there. You know, it's one of those lightning fast, fifty mile after work kind of rides. Mm -hmm. And um, I jumped in and did it. Um, and you know, Benville's got such a strong gravel scene. So you had a lot of gravel riders who were actually in in there doing the ride. And um, you, know, what I heard on numerous occasions is people because they, ha they hadn't been on a group ride on the road in so long. People say again and again, wow, I forgot how much fun this is mm -hmm. to haul ass on a road bike in a big group on a beautiful winding road. Gravel has so much magic that you can attribute to it, but there's something about being in that Peloton hauling ass on a road bike that I still think is the coolest thing that someone can experience on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. The rotation at the front at 27 miles an hour is just so awesome. Um, yeah, I love, there's nothing I like more than our Tuesday night worlds and it's that exact point. Um, so that was, that was a three parter. Why do you suppose there is this negativity towards USA cycling? Is it reparable, which we've been talking about for the last couple of minutes and three, <laughs> if you agree that it is the case, that there is negativity thrown towards governing bodies in USA Cycling. Why on earth would you take this seemingly thankless job? <laughs> um, well, I, a couple of reasons. 
I think um, one is I don't think it's thankless. Um, because I was on the board, I could see, I think the path the organization had been on the last six years. You know, you had 2015 to 2018, the organization lost its soul because of a lot of technology challenges that it tried to attack, mismanaged, and then just got crushed by. Hmm. Um, so it was three years of totally losing its way for that. Then 2018 to 2021, I mean, obviously it's COVID, so everybody knows about that. Yeah. But beyond that, there was a, the organization became obsessed with trying to increase the revenue of the organization by pursuing an enthusiast rider, a non-racing rider. Um, what, what I know about USA Cycling, because I've been a member since 1986, right? USA Cycling is a nonprofit. It exists to do two things. First of all, it exists to grow bike racing and second, at, at a grassroots level. Second of all, it exists to, to, to get you know, sustained international success with national teams. Um, that's it, plain and simple. Good nonprofit has a very simple mission. It's mm -hmm. extremely focused on what it is, uh, you know, what work they're doing to pursue that mission. It's not nonprofit and business. It's the same. It doesn't matter. Um, but you have to know what you're there to do, and you have to focus maniacally on it. In 2015 to 2021, that's exactly what this organization did not do. And so that's why I took the job, because I wanted to come in and say, do an experiment. What happens if we focus maniacally on growing the sport of bike racing at a grassroots level and, um, you know, supporting athletes for sustained international success, you know, mm -hmm. riding for our national team? What happens if we forget about the enthusiast rider? What happens if we say, you know what? Tech, you know, let's let's we got a lot of work to do in improving our website, but let's not pretend we're a technology company and try to reinvent the wheel. What happens if we take a disproportionate amount of our bandwidth and our money and we and we deploy it against the mission? What happens? And I'm really optimistic about where we're going to get. That's why I don't think it's thankless. Mm -hmm. um, I I I think there's going to be it's going to be incredible if we get. 10 Olympic medals in Tokyo. You have more people, um, you know, racing road bikes in America. We've got breathe new life into collegiate cycling. It's going to be you know, an amazing outcome. And that's, the, I care more about that than frankly, than selling more bike shorts or building more trail in Bentonville, yeah. right? This to me is a much higher calling than anything else I was doing. Um, and I think the other reason I'm doing it is that um, everything, as I said earlier in, in our conversation, Everything I have, I own, and I feel um, is all goes back to my love of bike racing. And um, everything I've done in that regard has been more or less for profit and uh, in pursuit of you know, increasing my bank account. You know, this is a time to give back. This is a time to, um, you know, I'm willing to have people um, say bad things about the organization that I work for because I, I'm so optimistic about where we're going to get. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take the heat because I have, I, I have a feeling that I want to give back to the sport that's given so much to me. Yeah. Well, that's magnificent. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, I guess it surprises me how much negativity there is and maybe it's the few and the loud um, only because you know, I know you tangentially. I know previous president or CEOs. I know a whole handful of people on the board and they have a similar outlook to what you just said. Like they are good people trying to do good things. And, and I think there's just this misconception that a governing body is negative and that it drives me crazy because I, I can't have this hour long conversation that you and I are having now. Um, yeah, I, I love the ambition and, and I hope it's going in the right direction. Um, as I, I think it's the, I think it's the, few, I think it's the few and the loud, Chad. Yeah. I really do. Um, you know, it's just, I think it's the nature of, of the times, but you know what we, we, um, um, we've gotten a lot of encouragement in the last, you know, five or six months. And that's just, that's just, uh, it's kind of like it's fuel for the fire. Sure. And uh, I think it's just making us as an organization that much more determined to be successful. Okay, so I know I have, I have good friends in the ski world and I know that there is pushback because Nordic skiing is part of the same governing body as alpine skiing, is the same governing body as snowboarding, as ski jumping, which is not the same as biathlon. But all those previous ones are US ski and snowboarding. Yep. 
They seem like disparate sports. Let's talk about what is under USA Cycling. We have road racing, mountain biking, track racing, cyclocross, BMX freestyle, and BMX racing. And probably another Correct. one or two that I'm forgetting. Like UCI trials riding, I believe. So I get that all of these sports have two wheels. Um, how, do, how, do you, how do you keep them all in check? And is it deserving to be under one umbrella or should they be separated into different sports? Um, I think that the, the, the structure is a function of the Olympic movement, right? This is just the way the IOC, USOPC, UCI, USA Cycling, they're all, you know, we're all related. We're all yeah. connected with each other. And so I think that's the, that's the reason for the structure. I think where we realize we are, um, where we're not great, that's an opportunity for us to partner up with people. I'll give you a good example of that. You know, USA BMX puts on, you know, more motos or, you know, more gates are dropped, more motos are run for BMX race by USA BMX, you know, by, by you know, a million times over than any other organization in the U S and we've got a great relationship with them. Um, you know, they, they, we have an agreement with them, a business agreement where they uh, help run our national championships. We work in a very collaborative way uh, in terms of world championships, and Olympic games. So I, I think that, there is some institutional self-awareness that we've got some strong spots and some places where we're a little bit distant and we found good ways to solve for that. I think BMX is, um, BMX is the best example. And the reality is BMX is the, is the cycling, this gigantic cycling force that nobody in the road mountain bike gravel scene talks about. Right. It is, but it's crazy. It is crazy. How many kids, um, race BMX, and it is crazy what a family. I mean, you, you think Nika is this kind of family event, valuable sort of, you know, valuable part of the cycling ecosystem. BMX is bonkers, hmm. and um, it does not get the love and does not get the credit for what a, a force that it is. You go look at this um, national stadium that USA BMX just built in Tulsa, and you you very quickly realize. Um, the size, the scale, the scope of BMX. This is, except for maybe the um, the velodrome out in Los Angeles, it's the single most impressive piece of cycling infrastructure that exists in the U.S. Um, and this is just the beginning in Tulsa. You know, they're going to build the same thing for freestyle. Uh, it's it's incredible. So, uh, anyways, uh, it's I, we make the structure work because I think we know our strengths and we know our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Oh well, yeah, not to mention anyone I know who has made the the segue from BMX to road racing, they have a mean sprint and they will yeah. light up any road racer in a sprint. Yeah. Well, and their technical skills are so good. You look at these supercross tracks now, yeah. you look at that drop that these guys go off. Yeah. It's it's about as the, one of the scariest things you can do on a bike. Yep. Um I mean you you hit on it a second ago. The, the the overarching question is how much of USA Cycling's value is as a result of the Olympics? And so maybe an even bigger question is what is what is the seemingly future of the Olympics in general? Like viewership is down. They're, they're, they get so much pushback for being wasteful and, and corrupt and a money-making enterprise. Balance those two things. What is the future yeah. of, of the Olympics and where does USAC fit into the Olympic picture? I think um, there have been a couple of tough Olympics. You know, uh, we all I forget the movie about Sochi, Russia, yeah. um, that yeah, amazing yeah, yeah, movie yeah. about um, Icarus. Icarus, yeah. I mean, we all watched that. You know, make you shake your head. Right. You know, Beijing, uh, to you know, Tokyo because of COVID was super tough. And I think from a U.S. standpoint, dealing with Asian games is really hard from a television standpoint. Um, you know, I think that NBC um, is still figuring out how do you effectively broadcast this long tail of amazing, but you know, all these niche incredible sports. Um, and I think they're gonna they'll have that cracked for Paris. Um, and so I think it's going to be a lot easier to, to, to watch in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you've had a few tough games. You look at the next three games, though, you've got uh, amazing locations. Um, and um, I think it's going to be very favorable from a, from a kind of time of day standpoint. You've got Paris in 24. You've got um, Cortina, which I think is basically like Milan, right? In mm -hmm. 20, you would know better than me. Um, yeah. 
in in 26 and then you've got LA in 28 and I think the LA 28 games are going to be it's going to be one of the biggest media spectacles in the history of American media huh. and uh, that I, I wake up every day thinking about LA 2028 I've got a sticky note on my bathroom mirror that says 12 to 15 medals LA 2028 and we are incredibly motivated to um, re-engineer our organization re-engineer you know how we think about funding to best do talent identification talent development uh, talent integration and support of our elite athletes who are gonna we hope deliver those medals in 2028 but I think I think the Olympics particularly in America, it's there is going to be a a, a a real return of relevance of the games, and um, LA twenty eight is going to be a huge part of that. In terms of corruption at the IOC, I mean, I, definitely there was that was the case back in the day. I, I feel like um, a lot of that has been solved for. Um, I have not seen the stories of corruption in the ways that you did you know, like leading up to the Salt Lake games in 02, mm-hmm. um, where Mitt Romney had to come in and save the day. Um, but, uh, yeah, I am, I am optimistic and I am bullish. The other thing too, frankly, is that, that we are, um, you know, one of our closest financial partners is the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. The USOPC gives us a significant chunk of money every year to support our operations and service of, of um, the national team, Team USA, and um, direct athlete support for um, uh, our medal capable athletes or our potential Olympians. I mean, look, you mentioned all of those disciplines. Road men, those dudes can earn a living, as you know. Only in the last few years could women on the road earn a living doing that. Um, but mountain bike, you know, you're talking, you know, Chris Blevins, Haley Batten, you know, Kate kind of athletes, they can earn a living. Once you start getting below that, those kids are young, probably a lot of parental support, a lot of other maybe, you know, small sponsor support. But, you know, they, they're kind of on a nice edge financially. And if you're the next level down, you're not earning a cent from racing mountain bikes. Yeah. BMX race, if you're not a Connor Fields Olympic gold medal winning kind of racer, it's really tough to make a living. BMX freestyle is really tough to make a, a living. And cyclocross, obviously, you know, sadly, it's not an Olympic sport, but you're, 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 not, you're not making a living. And so the direct athlete support, the financial support that we can give those athletes so they can train and not have to work a job 30 hours a week while they're trying to be an Olympian is the difference between staying, uh, you know, st- continuing to be an athlete or retiring. Mm-hmm. But you look at Kristen Armstrong, right? Kristen Armstrong, arguably the well you know one of the great american bike racers in the history of the sport sure. she won gold medals 08 12 16 the only american you know maybe the only cyclist to win three golds and three subsequent uh, olympics in the history of the sport um and just fearsome competitor to this day one of the most intimidating people you'll ever be ever be around while all this was going on while she was crushing the world in the most one of the most dominant time trialers uh time trials ever Mm -hmm. she was mixing paint at home depot to be able to make her ends meet Mm -hmm. right that's just not right Mm -hmm. and so the usopc uh is a really generous benefactor to give support to the athletes so they can make ends meet but the number one reason why elite level cyclists Road men is just an anomalous thing over here. Set that aside. But you look at all other disciplines. The number one reason why athletes leave the the sport, it's not that they're scared of crashing. It's not that they're tired and and they're achy and they don't recover as well. It's financial pressure is why they quit. And um, that's one way that we as an organization can be essential to these athletes and all of these disciplines. So say that that name of that organization, that was U.S.? Olympic meeting? USOPC, yeah, and are, used is, to be called the USOC. Yeah, how are they funded? Is that partially government funded? No government funding in the Olympic wow. movement in the United States. Right, British cycling gets all their funding from lottery. I mean, it's insane with their yeah. budget. I think their budget is five times what ours is, and it's all government funding. They don't have to work for any of that. During COVID, they didn't lose a cent. Yeah. During COVID, we fired seventy-five percent of our workforce. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And uh, USOPC, no, it's all it's all uh, it's all uh, donors and corporate funding. 
It's your corporate sponsorship. Goodness. It's hard. It's yeah. hard. Well, yeah, shoot. Uh, back up 45 minutes. How much of your job or the board's job is, is the pursuit of financial support? A lot. Mine in particular is yeah. a lot. Um, it's, it's critical. I mean, we've, we've, um, for us to achieve our goals as an organization, uh, the budget, our, our budgets have to go up. We're in a place right now where actually membership and racer days, they're kind of tra racing is coming back in the U S at a grassroots level, which is really great to see. Mm -hmm. We are you know, through the first five months of this year, we're seeing, um, our membership numbers and our racer day numbers exceeding 2019, which is really, really good. Um, and so we're starting to see some health come back to the grassroots side of the sport, which I'm so grateful for. But on the sports performance side of the business, I will tell you that the number one, I would say, shocking thing that I discovered when I took over as CEO was the how gutted our U23 and junior development programs were for you know, national teams, national camps, international travel, what coaching was like, the amount of time these kids spend in Europe, uh, basically all of that spending. It started getting gutted in 2016. Mm -hmm. After COVID, all of that stuff got nuked. And so our support of the future of elite level cycling in the U.S. right now uh, is in a really rough spot. And so I spend a lot of time going out there trying to raise money because without those generous donors, we're not going to be able to breathe new life back into those U23 and uh, junior development programs. And we've got to do it. It's a life or death thing that we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a huge part of my segue in the sport. Uh, during my collegiate days, got to race with the U23 team. And it was it's, it is so fascinating. I think it's fascinating for any any... Um, anyone not from the continent, so to speak. So, you know, North America, uh, Africa, Australia, the whole oceanic region. I mean, it's, it's, it's seismic. The value to spend time racing at that age in Europe, but also just the cultural shock. So you need those programs. Um, and right in the U.S., for all the places you just mentioned, the cost of doing that is astronomical. I mean, it's what yes. a huge, we're a huge disadvantage. Not only are we not getting government funding, yeah. but then the cost for us to send our kids to where the racing is best is so much more expensive. Yeah. It's just a, it's a double whammy. It is. Um, okay, switching gears, unintentionally opening up a can of worms. We've talked about it a little bit. Gravel, you know? Yeah. Gravel's gravel's huge there's there's i feel like the sentiment among people who have raced on the road in the past and they've they've stopped for any number of reasons is they don't want usa cycling because there's a bunch of rules to which i ask like well what are you talking about what rules and maybe these rules do exist and i'm just incredibly naive i don't know what what usa cycling is is doing to stifle the growth of gravel. That said, I feel like gravel is operating very independently of USA Cycling. So how do you yep. how do you uh, combine the two so that everybody wins? Well, I think that's exactly right. I think that the the narrative that just a lot of people with strong opinions. Um, I think that um, you know the. The narrative out there is that it's a uh, it's a zero sum game, you know. It's USA Cycling is going to come in and try to crush the sport. Right. Yep. Obviously, that's not. It's just. Yeah, Ted. That's what we're going to do. I know. We're going to come it's in like, and steal your gargoyle? Gun. Yeah, we're going to go kill this sport. <laughs> that is so cool. So, um, you know what we view that we can be, we can join in and be part of the magic that is this movement. Look, gravel is elemental in growing participation and creating passion for the sport. Why would we not do everything humanly possible to be supportive of that? Mm -hmm. That is what we're here to do. You know, we want people to, to get out there, be on their bikes, learn how to train. And again, we build pathways from gravel into road or into mountain. And, you know, perhaps those people will come over, they'll become members and they will race mountain bikes and race gravel and they'll race road bikes and race gravel. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we, we um, have no ambition to come in and ruin the fun. I do think there are ways in which we can, um, you know, actively 
be, be part of the ecosystem that adds to the ecosystem. You know, one is just it's partnering up with gravel event organizers and the gravel movement as a whole to build awareness and pathways into road racing and mountain biking. I mean, I think that makes logical sense. Cyclists are, from a, on a discipline standpoint, they're promiscuous. You know, I'm going to ride my road bike today. I'm going to ride my mountain bike tomorrow. This is just how we get down. I'm going to ride my gravel bike that day. I'm going to ride my road bike this day. Building pathways is important. That's one way we're going to be involved. Another way we're going to be involved is I do think there is a role for us in events. Um, I do think a U.S. National Gravel Championship makes good sense. Um, I don't think it, it means Unbound is any less prestigious and amazing than it is. I don't think it means that SBT is anything different than what it is. I just think it's, it's just an additional race on the calendar. And I, I don't, I, don't I, I, uh, I struggle to understand how um, um, it does anything but add to the calendar and add uh, just another magical event. So, um, you know, you can expect to see that coming. Um, I'm hoping for next year, but if not next year, 2024. And um, yes, there will be rules about, pools. you know, should women be able to have male teammates? Should there, should there only be, um, should there only be neutral feeding, um, you know, so on and so forth, you know, does, is, you know, self-regulation do, does the gravel community think self-regulation is going to be the way, this is the way it's going to be forever? And as more Europeans come over and as prize purses get bigger, I mean, Ted, you raced in Europe five years, is that right? Uh, seven. Seven years, oh my God. You know, doping, if there's money there and there are Europeans there, how do you feel about doping? Yeah. I mean, do you think doping is, is ever gonna be an issue in, in gravel? I do. Yeah. Um, and how, you know, does, is that, is that, draconian oversight if we are supportive of a gravel movement to create some controls in place to make sure that um, the the riders have fair play at the you know, on the fast end of the sport I, I don't think so but that's that's my opinion but that's that's you know that's kind of the approach that we're taking you know inevitably there there we've all heard the the stories about gravel world championship you know I think that inevitably is going to happen but it's it's um, I, and I don't think the UCI is trying to come in and crush the sport. And so I think the, 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 the issue is the narrative of if the UCI or USA Cycling comes in, it, um, they're, they're coming in as an invasion force trying to take, it all, take away all the fun. I don't think that's the case. Um, I think there are ways that we can support a, be supportive of something that is incredible and magical and very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, is... Well, for one, among those those uh, <laughs> things that we need to figure out, be it how do you um, have or not have male domestiques for female riders, or what do feed zones look like, or outside support, I, I strongly promote getting rid of arrow bars. I think that should be banned yes. in gravel events. Yes, I meant to mention that one. That one, it, <laughs> it was relevant because we with, with Unbound just around the corner, there's a whole bunch of us on an email list trying to get our head around that one. Um, no, all very valid points. And I, I mean, I struggle with it myself, right? Like I, I came to gravel very early on amid this, you know, gravel preceded me by many <laughs> generations. Um, but I was early advent from the world tour. And what I loved about it was its casual nature. And, and uh, I don't know, it's how it has this rebel tone to it. It's punk rock. It's fun. There's... <laughs> I feel like the inevitability of the popularity of gravel is that if it weren't for me, somebody else would have done it. And, and it's only grown and the level of competition has gotten that much more fierce and that begets all of these issues that we're talking about. Um, so it's sort of a victim of its own success in order to, to initiate rules such as these, which are conversations to be had, which is I'm ha why I'm having this conversation with you and why, why I think it's valuable to have all the all the partners involved be part of the conversation, but yeah, there's certainly an inevitability to it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think as we, um, you know, as we develop our view of what you know, rules would be, for example, for a, you know, a national championship, this is not going to be USA cycling deciding this in a vacuum, right? This is going to be bringing in riders, um, bringing in race organizers and trying to get a collaborative view on what's best for everybody involved. I mean, that is, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's the only, that's the only path forward for us. 
Uh, and I do think it needs to happen. I mean, you, you could just see it from reading the race reports in Mellow News. You know, a year, two years ago, the race reports were not talking about power meters and teamwork and Europeans and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and what, you know, what's what, what, and this is, this is take my USA cycling hat off, just put my individual, somebody who loves the sport hat on. It seems like there's this kind of bifurcation going on in gravel where what you've got is you've got the events where, you know, they're fun and they've got things on the side and fun rest stops and, you know, the event in California where you've got the kiddie pools with all the plastic balls in it. Yeah. You've got those those kinds of events, which are amazing experiences where everybody's you know suffering a lot, but also there's a heavy emphasis of celebrating your love of gravel. Mm -hmm. But then over here, you've got stuff where, man, this is like hardcore racing going on. And I think as that bifurcation happens, it's going to be pretty fascinating to see what's what does that punk rock ethos, what's mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. when this part of it, which is hard, it's like it's road racing on gravel. Yeah. W what does this turn into over here? What does this become? Like fast forward, look how much has changed in two years. What happens in five years from now? And I think that, you know, I'm sure all the thoughtful people, you, chemo, these, I'm sure everybody's got a pretty well-defined view of what it's going to look like. But I think it's a, it's a world where safe courses – some kind of rules, uh, doping control, um, and just, it's just, um, you know, all of that stuff is going to be beneficial. Yeah. Safe courses is one of the first things that comes to mind just because these, these events are taking place on open roads, quite, quite frankly. And it's up to the organizer to be looking out for the safety of the riders. And I think most organizers have that top in front of mind, but it's still, it's not a closed course. It's not an industrial parkway. It's uh, yep. It's important. Okay, uh, you have been extremely generous with your time. We're gonna wrap up with three softball questions. <laughs> um, number one, favorite place to ride a bike. Two, what is the number one place you would like to ride your bike that you've never ridden? And three, with whom, living or otherwise, would you enjoy going for a bike ride? Favorite place in the world to ride a bike is Texas Hill Country, Fredericksburg. Um, it's the. Have you have you ever ridden there before? Uh, not knowingly. I've ridden my uh, my bike okay. in Texas a handful of times, but I can't say I've been there. Yeah, I mean it's just extremely tough terrain, very hilly, yeah. incredible density of roads, and very low traffic. Nice. Beautiful. Um, I absolutely love riding in Texas Hill Country. Great answer. Um, place I want to ride my bike the most that I didn't uh, would be Japan. I was scheduled to do a big Japan tour with Simon Matram, mm -hmm. uh, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's a 10-day tour of Japan on bike um, the summer of 2020. So that was, you know, COVID squashed that, but I was looking forward to that more than uh, to, to this day. I'm just like, oh, I yeah. wish I'd been able to go on that trip. Yeah. Uh, and what person would I want to ride with uh, more than anybody else? Oh man, that's a, there are a lot of people. Um, there are a lot, a lot of people. There was a, I'll tell you my, if I could have me answer it in a different way. I think probably the single coolest ride I've ever done in my life, my 40th birthday, I went to Girona with a bunch of friends and I was um, good friends with, there's a, Craig Lewis. Oh, you know, oh, Craig, sure. I think I yeah, saw yeah. you at Craig's house once. Yep. Craig was racing for high road, um, living in Girona. Mm hmm and I went on a training ride in Girona with uh, Garmin era, David Miller, Michael Berry. Um, God, who is the, who is the Canadian guy? Ryder? Um, yeah, not Ryder. Um, Sven Tuft. Kind of, not Sven Tuft. There's the one other guy, French Canadian guy. Your era. Uh, oh, you're, you're going to think of him. Dominique Guillaume... Roland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dom <laughs> Dominique Roland was there. There were some pro women there and like four of my best friends from the U.S. there. And so we had a peloton of about, a group of about 12 people, mm -hmm. um, six, you know, pros at their peak, six, you know, knucklehead masters bike racers like me. Yeah. And I, I saw what a real training day was like. And I was like, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was, you know, Jerome is incredible, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, 
And to have that experience, if I could re- if I could have that day, it was a few days, but there was one day in particular that was epic. If I could do that again um, with that crew of people, uh, that would be a lot of fun. Nice, that's a terrific answer. Yeah, drone is special. It's it's fascinating. It's almost like a, a example of gravel. It's this town that just boomed in a short period of time, and now it's this epicenter of riding bikes. Well, yeah, there's a bullet train now, or bullet train, I say yeah. bullet train, there's a high-speed train that goes yeah. from Barcelona back in the day, you mm-hmm. know, that didn't have it. Mm-hmm. So I, I can't imagine, it's just that much easier to get there now. That that would be a close second after Texas Hill Country if where I'd want to ride. Nice. Corona. Well, I dig that. Uh, let me know if you go to Japan, because that's my number one place I'd like to ride my bike also. Um, All right. And a couple of folks totally out of their element, I think would be an entertaining bike ride. <laughs> a very entertaining. Um, well, thanks for having me on, Ted. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate the time, Brendan. Um, this has been awesome. It's nice to nice to make the conversation. So thanks for your insight. Be good. Good luck with the baby. Thank you. <laughs>